We are live streaming? Yeah. Oh, yeah? Okay. Cool. We can start. Yay! <laughs> All right. We are functional, everyone. Um, hi, and welcome. My name is Catherine McClellan. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight um, to my artist talk about the Complicated History Project. Um, I just want to start out by saying a few thank yous. <laughs> so I'll do a quick, uh, so uh, what I was trying to say was I wanted to do a quick thank you. Um, number one was to the Rockhampton Cultural Council. This, um, this was a partially grant funded project. Also to all my friends and family who also helped fund this project and gave me a ton of help and support to get this done. Um, this has been a two years in the making and there was a lot of support along the way. Um, also recently, um, I uh, was able to connect with Healing Racism and Vanessa Otero, um, who was incredibly gracious um, and able to meet with me and gave me a lot of feedback and encouragement, which was greatly appreciated. Um, as well as uh, Northampton Open Media, um, we did trainings for the library and Mass Humanities for the live stream equipment. So, yeah. All right. So, complicated history. Where this, so I'm assuming everyone who's here in person has seen the wall right outside this room. Those who are on um, the internet, if you've been on TikTok, you've seen me do plenty of videos about the making of this. Um, and those who have not been in person who may or may not hear me on YouTube. Um, the idea is that this is um, a wall of portraits of my family, my ancestors, that are interactive. So there is the actual physical art that you see, and then beyond those portraits, there's actually an interaction for anyone notice that the lights go on and off depending if you're moving around it. Um, but then there's also an online component where you can learn more about all um, the, the research they end up doing around these family members. So today what I thought I'd do is I'd spend a little time talking about where this project started. Um, then I'm going to talk about kind of what I came across in my search in my family, um, what I knew beforehand, and then what I learned while doing this project and looking at it through this very specific um, and then I'll do a little bit of talking about how I actually made the pieces, so the, the kind of art part. Um, so this actually started as an assignment, and it was June 2020, and um, an artist that I follow and know, um, she's a local artist, Kathy Douglas, um, she posted on Instagram this article by Ram Wall, right? And so the idea was um, this was to get white artists to think about how they can create art. And so it's a syllabus for making art about race to the white artist in America. And it's kind of broken up into four weeks. And so there's different assignments along the way. And week four challenged artists to find, document, and archive their family's relationship to the three root traumas of his American history, slavery, genocide, and warfare. So when I saw all this, I was immediately struck. I, I knew a decent amount about my family history. I'd always been interested in my family history. Um, I have an aunt who did an extensive amount of research on my family, particularly in this area. Um, and so I kind of had like a basic understanding of how long my family had been in Massachusetts. And so I knew that it was very high likely that based on how long our families had been here, that my family intersected with all three of these root traumas and definitely on the side of the oppressor. So I was then thinking about you know, how am I going to go about looking into my history of this and started kind of poking around. So going into this, I knew about this guy. Um, and anyone who's really familiar with Northampton history may know him. Um, his name is Samuel Lyman Hinckley. Um, he was the son of Sophia um, and Joseph Lyman, the grandson of Judge Samuel Hinckley. Um, and so I knew all of that basically. Um, I knew he was a big deal. There was a rumor of a bust of him in the courthouse, which I didn't to see. I don't know if someone told me that. But like, so there are all these like myths, right? The family stories that go around about this guy. Um, I knew that he was involved in the Northampton Cutlery Company. I didn't really know anything about it, I didn't know where it was, but I knew that was a thing. Um, I also knew about this lady, um, who actually is his daughter-in-law, this is Mary Wright Barrett. Um, and the reason I knew about her is I worked with someone who worked at the Northampton Historic Society one year early on when we moved into the area as a birthday present. She gave me a folder of family pictures, and a lot of them were of Mary Wright. Uh, Mary Wright. So um, I kind of knew about her, but only through pictures. Know anything about her. I did know that we had a family house, um, and that was known as the manse. Um, and I didn't really know who had lived there, I just knew that my dad knew about it because his dad grew up there. So I knew that. Um, the manse still exists, and I believe it is owned by Smith at this point, it's a private residence. Um, I also knew through kind of family myth that we were related to the Rose Clan and there was a castle in Scotland that we could go to because our family lived in and it was proven by. This was the family story. So I knew about those things. 
Um, but that was it kind of, as far as it was mostly in that kind of myth realm, right? I didn't have a lot of actual hard evidence of any of this stuff. I just knew vaguely it existed, right? So, what I learned was, when I started digging in, that Samuel Lyman Hinckley married Henrietta Rose um, Elizabeth Rose. And so what I did not realize was that she was from Sumter, South Carolina. And so as soon as I saw that, I said, because this is the 1800s, she was born in 1818. Um, and so I knew it was very likely that her family were enslaved. Um, and so it didn't take long for me to find her mother, Elizabeth Singleton. And what I specifically found was this document. This is just one page of the document. It's a long document. It's a marriage agreement. And it's kind of a pre nup agreement, which is, I thought, very interesting for 1827. Um, and so what it does is it lists her property and it says that it's not going to go to her second husband, it's going to go to her sole son, who I think is interesting because he doesn't exist. I find no evidence of him anywhere. Um, but it's interesting. And then it lists her property. And so I don't know if you can tell in that highlighted section, but along with um, a considerable safe and a feather bed and furniture, there are listed six enslaved persons. And so that was that first moment where I knew for sure that my ancestors were enslavers. And so as someone who had firmly believed that my entire ancestry was pretty much based in Connecticut, Massachusetts, this was not surprising per se, but kind of it was like, a, you know, it was one of those moments. Um, but, so I moved on from there and I started thinking about what story could I tell coming down from that lineage. So this chart is really, I, it was funny, going into this, I'd never seen a chart like this before and I had a lot of they haven't seen getting charged this way. It's a great way to show direct lineage. So this is a seventh generation chart, and on the outer rim are my four times great grandparents. And then it goes in from there. So up at the top, you see Danny Rose, who emigrated from Stockton, and Elizabeth Singleton, who was the daughter of a plantation. Both of those people were in slaves. I have paper evidence that they owned the people. Um, and then they have their daughter, Henrietta Elizabeth, who then ends up marrying. Samuel Lyman, take a So in the red here, you see the people who are off the wall. Okay, so you see Elizabeth, Sam, Henrietta, Henry, and then Mary. So those are the five people that are on my wall. And so what I started to realize was there was a very interesting um, duality going on for my ancestors here in New York who had connections to the South through Henrietta and Elizabeth, and then also connections to a lot of the stuff that's happening here even in Florence, which if anyone knows local history at this time, was a hotbed of abolition in that So it's a very interesting kind of dual existence that's happening in a very privileged family. So when I'm doing my research, I didn't find a ton of information on the women, which I know anyone who's done a lot of research will not be really surprised by this, that it is harder to find women's voices in history. Um, there are letters from Elizabeth and Mary there is nothing about him. Um, Henrietta, all I know is that somehow she married Sam, they were married in Charleston um, in 38, and moved to Northampton. She had a baby in December and died 10 days later. She was 21 years old. So I don't, there's really nothing about her. I have a portrait of her, and that is it, um, that I use as my reference for the image. Um, so what I decided for this presentation, I was going to focus only mainly in on Sam and Henry, because what I have from then, thanks to my great great aunt Rose, who was Henry's daughter, she transcribed um, many of the letters. And so between the years of 1855 to 1866, there are hundreds of letters between Sam's, uh, Sam and Anne, which is Henry's stepmother, they got married again, and Henry. So there's a plethora of first person narratives about what they felt, about what was going on. If you imagine, from 1855 to 1866, those are pretty significant years in the 19th century. So, um, just to establish the privilege of these families, so interestingly enough, Samuel Lyman Hinckley was not a Hinckley. He was a Lyman. His father was Joseph Lyman. Now, as I said before, his grandfather was Judge Hinckley. And so what he did was, when he was, I think, around 21, he changed his name to Samuel Lyman Hinckley to carry on the now, the Hinkley name arrived as early as, let's say, I put the date that's over, I wouldn't remember, 1634. 
So Samus, um, Samuel Hinckley and his son Thomas Hinckley um, arrived. Thomas Hinckley ended up being the last governor of the Plymouth Colony before it went to the Bay Colony. Um, so this is a family that has deep roots in Massachusetts as far as English colonizers, right? Um, also, as I talked about Judge Hinckley, this is a family that had a lot of money and a lot of investments. And Samuel Hinckley um, bought a township in Ohio. So there's a township in Ohio, in Clay, Ohio, that was bought by one of my ancestors. So it's just kind of an evidence of like the kind of money this family was working with. Um, then we have the Lyman family. See, as I said, he's actually a Lyman. And there's more than one branch of the Lyman family. Anyone who knows about the Lyman orchards in Connecticut, that's distantly related and actually from Richard Lyman. But the family split, so there's a Northampton side and a Connecticut side. But Richard Lyman arrived as early as, what was it, 1631. And he was actually one of the settlers that settled Harper. And so he's on the founder's monument in Harper. So these are families that have these really long colonial histories. Um, what I did not know when I started doing this research was that Samuel Lyman Hinckley invested in Samuel Hill's silk mill. So if anyone knows anything about Florence at this time, um, there was the Northampton Association of Education and Industry, otherwise known as the community. And so this was kind of a utopian society because the idea was that you were offering an alternative to slave labor cotton through silk. So Samuel Hill bought it from Samuel White Marsh. So a lot of sales. <laughs> um, so White Marsh had actually tried to do, there's a whole silk cultivation he tries to do where he has people in Northampton worms and there's this whole thing that happens, it actually kind of bombs out. Samuel Hill takes over and he starts importing silk from Japan. He needs backwards. So he gets one from Samuel Lyman Hinckley. Now apparently this was slightly controversial because remember Samuel Lyman Hinckley married a southerner. And so there's that and also Samuel Lyman Hinckley is not the most supportive person of that nation. Um, and so there's a few things that happened during this time period that kind of illustrate where he stands on the issues um, and where Henry stands on the issues. So um, we're going to start in 1860. So it's the spring of 1860. Um, war is not yet broken out, but things are kind of heating up a little bit, right? The tensions are high. Um, and this is in between Henry going from being in college at Yale, and he's about to head off to two years in Europe. Um, and he's going to visit his son and family. He's never met his grandmother before. Um, and there's a note um, that starts to give us an idea of who Henry is and who his parents are. And his stepmother writes to him, your father is feeling a great deal of anxiety about you going south without being willing to tell you so. In the present state of the country, he says, they would not hesitate to shoot you down for the slightest expression of your opinion on the subject of slavery he looks upon it as a very dangerous journey. So this, and this is kind of one of the earlier mentions I have of like kind of the paintings going on at this point. And we see that Henry is perhaps more um, sympathetic to the abolitionist cause. His parents, maybe not so much, and they're particularly concerned about him going south. Now, he does make this trip, and this is when we get our first voice from Elizabeth. So Elizabeth writes after he's visited, and this is the first time we've heard from her. She says, my dear grandson, your kind favor of the 26th and enclosed check was received for me a few days since. I was delighted to hear that you had arrived safely in New York, and I hope at this time you are safely at home. You will accept my thanks for your kindness and be assured that it is with feelings of greatest affection that I wish you a prosperous journey through life. I shall not now die better satisfied that I see my own dear grandson, the offspring of my beloved daughter, and to know that he has a feeling of affection for me. Please give my love to your father and say to him I will be delighted to see him in my old age, and that he must try to pay me a visit. Farewell, my dear child, and may God guide and direct you in this life. Your affectionate grandmother is Elizabeth Rodney. So that was her new married name. So we see that he must have behaved himself and kept his mouth closed on his visit to his grandmother. And he's now sending her money. Now this, this idea of them sending her checks um, continues. So this now becomes kind of a regular activity. So remember, at this point, the Hinkleys are invested in the silk mills, and a lot of their income are coming from the silk mills. And remember, the silk mills are an abolitionist invention, right? He's then taking the money that he's earning, and it's being sent to an enslaver in the South. Mm -hmm. 
So it's just kind of an interesting duality there. Um, now, in March of 61, she even asked, which did, so they're setting her kind of regular, like, I think, what I could tell was $100 for her demons. Um, but here she asked for more, so I'm compelled to ask a favor of you to assist me at this time. I am much distressed about my affairs. I am owing 300 which I am not able to pay. My creditors say they cannot wait any longer. The above amount will pay, off, pay them off, and my mind will be much relieved. And so there's this back and forth between Henry and his father about paying grandma, and he's over in Europe. Um, and this is also, if you remember, the time of the war is ending. So tensions are rising, they're trying to get money to grandma. Um, and so that's happening. And it was in one of these conversations um, that Sam was trying to tell Henry, don't bother sending her stuff, the mail has been shut down. Um, and we get to see one idea of how he divides Elizabeth from other Southerners. So he says, um, uh, it's warning Henry after her due to mail stop, he says, um, the innocent must suffer with the guilt. So he's kind of placing Elizabeth in a separate cabin. Um, in January of 61, he's writing to Henry, this is this letter is, he often pontificates on the state of the country in the war. Um, but this one in particular, there was a lot in this letter. Um, the one quote, we really start to see how Sam feels about what's going on. Um, and so he says, reason and imagination cannot fathom the evils of such a civil war. It may be unchristian and unprincipled, but rather than such a war, I would let slavery into the territories. And then he kind of goes on for a little bit, and he says, neither slavery, in my opinion, is not the greatest evil in this evil world. So he's kind of clearly stated that he is on the side of peace at all costs, um, which I think, you know, he's capitalist, he's invested in money, and the economy is stable. He wants a stable um, colony or United States. Um, then Henry, um, just later that month, he writes back to his father about what's going on. And he's very much on the other side of things. Mm -hmm. He says, for my part, I am immensely delighted. The world has been stagnant long enough. Fifty years more of uh, unbroken peace and prosperity under such an evil as slave power would be enough to ruin any nation. Mm -hmm. And there are a few times when Sam and Anne, his stepmother, are writing to him, and they're like, well, we know you don't agree with us, we don't want to argue, but, you know, it's, they're still pontificating their points of view about it. Um, later on, you get a little clue as to how Sam feels about the abolitionist movement. Um, so in June of 61, he writes, they, he was starting out the South, have acted infamously and abolitionists shamefully. I wish to see abolitionists in the front of the battle, but they are all peace anti-war men. They have stirred up bad blood and now be peaceful law-abiding people to quell the commotion. And I have no patience with fanaticism. So he very much, Kind of, you know, that stodgy old guy who wants things to stay the same and be solid and clear, um, and is very comfortable in that system. Um, and Henry, being the young guy, is a little more pushing toward change. And it's kind of a familiar story, I think. <clears throat> so then Henry, um, while all this is happening, is over in Europe. He writes, "It quite stirs my blood to hear so many of my old acquaintances going to war." I wish you could do something about my total ignorance on all military matters. I could only help um, another bull run by my inefficiency. So he kind of recognizes his inadequacy in military matters. I mean, he is a very privileged child um, who has kind of lived a very uneventful life as far as that goes. Um, so in the end, though, Sam starts to come around. So as the war is going on, it's like in 62, he really, the Enneagram kind of started to come around to it. And, but he still thinks the war is going to end soon. Like, he, as far as he's concerned, the war will be done in a few months. It won't be a thing. Um, but he is starting to see the necessity of it and is kind of stirred up um, by the audacity of the Southerners. So in March of 62, um, he's starting to change his viewpoint a bit. And he says, it's hard for me to be patriotic. I am coming to it. For the practical abolitionists behave badly, unscrupulous, mean, tyrannical, mean-spirited slave holders have behaved worse. Thou, now they must cave or die, and slavery die with them. Slavery is doomed in all events. So it seems like he's starting to shift a little bit about where he is on the issues. Though it is interesting that he's still very much dividing his mother-in-law 
If you notice, if you're not condemning slavery here, he is said the tyr tyrannical, mean-spirited slave holders. He's very much putting it in their court, and he's also not continuing, he's not um, connecting his mother-in-law with that. She is in her, he's, she's one of those not guilty, innocent people that are being um, torn apart by this. Um, so what happens then is um, Henry comes home, he goes to law school in Harvard, but he decides he's going to get involved. And so in March um, 23rd, 1864, he um, is commissioned in the Massachusetts Fifth Cavalry. So I don't know if anyone knows anything about the Massachusetts Fifth Cavalry. It was an all-volunteer black unit. Um, and so it was common that um, the officers in the black units were white. Um, uh, and it is also interesting, this is the same unit or regiment that Charles Douglas was a part of. This is Frederick Douglass's son. So this is someone who would have been Henry's contemporary and from the same era, um, but obviously of a very different background. Um, so I have 29 letters that Henry wrote during this time. So there's a ton of information about this um, coming from his own voice about what his experiences were like at the second lieutenant in the last year of Calvary. Now, it is immediately clear from his letters that this is kind of like an adventure for him straight off, right? So in the beginning, his letters are kind of like this, like the most boyish, kind of like, isn't this great? Um, and also that he is very unfamiliar with being around Latin Americans. Um, and so there is a quote from a letter that he writes in May. So at this point, they shipped out. Um, they're on the way down to where they spend most of their time, which is Point Rock, Virginia. And he's writing this. There is nothing like getting used to things. When I first joined the regiment, I rather shrank from not look them in the face without breaking into a broad grin. Now I look at them in quite as a matter of course. I have nested with them out of the same pork barrel, drank out of their canteens, lent them my blankets, borrowed their overcoats without a particle of fastidiousness, which I feel toward my best friends coming into the army. And so it's kind of like immediately clear that like he's like, look at me, like, you know, I'm getting all comfortable with this. And it's, it's, it's just kind of like a clear picture of his privilege um, and kind of how separate his life <clears throat> from those around him. Um, so most of his letters, it's kind of funny, it, it, you know, like any, anyone who's read any letters from any soldiers, there's the ups and downs when the letter gets bad and it gets pretty long, and, you know, there's that. Now, the, the Fifth Cavalry didn't see much action, but they did, um, they were um, in action on, um, uh, in Petersburg, right at the beginning, um, on, uh, I think it was April 15th, and it was the Battle of Angler Farm. Now, the cavalry was dismounted, so the officers were not. The white guys saw their horses. The black cavalry were dismounted. Um, they were not drilled as infantry, but they were put into service as infantry. Um, and so there was a bit of a kind of, it depends on who you talk to, and there's interesting look at the different accounts of that battle. It was a bit of a hot mess um, about what went on. So Henry, his account um, is he's bragging about his soldiers. So by this point, he has kind of, he's been with them um, since March, right? So we're now in April. Um, and, or actually, this is going to be I'm sorry, it's going to be um, Because it's after. Uh, so anyways, he's, he's starting to kind of have that camaraderie that happens in the military, or anyone who goes through kind of in extreme circumstances. Um, so right here, we start to see him start to gain a different appreciation um, for his soldiers. And one of his quotes is, um, he's writing to his friends, I've not had the opportunity to give you any particulars on the 15th before Petersburg, but the colored troops so nobly asserted their manhood. And so then he goes on to have this, he's a very poetic writer. Um, Henry was very good writer, uh, very well educated. Um, and so he gives this beautiful account of how, you know, he gets into the battle. But then, after the battle is done, and they've taken the guns, um, they are put into service, um, kind of watching the backs of people. They were actually taken out because of kind of the office that was happening. Um, but at the end, they're marched across the fields and spent the night um, in um, the ditches in front of the encampment. And he talks about that march across and looking up at the walls and kind of the, 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 um, of the rebels and being kind of in awe of that and how could they have fallen. And he says, I do not believe they could have been taken, but for the terror the colored troops inspired. They rushed on like howling devils. Remember Fort Pillow being the battle cry, 
and butchered, butchered everything and quit not run away. Johnny Red never shocked his grandmother more effectively than by that proceeding. The perfect fury and hatred which our boys feel for them is appalling. And so I think it, it's one of those moments where he's starting to have an inkling, maybe, of kind of the, the, the emotional side of things. And I don't think before this he had any real kind of inkling of the emotional damage the system that his grandmother was part of was causing. And this is one of those moments where you start to see a little bit of his acknowledgement of, of the emotional side of things. Um, so it's interesting to me that all these characters, you know, there's all these letters and all these things, I could go on forever, I'm going to still leave it there with those, those quotes, but the, the idea that these guys, when you look at them on the surface, tell one story. And you dig just a little bit deeper and you realize how complicated it is. They're not good, they're not bad. They are who they are in that time period. And that time period was greatly problematic, just like ours is. And so it's, I am really interested in the idea of not trying to simplify who we are or who we, like, where we came from and recognize the complexities of it and not trying to turn it into a black and white kind of thing or at least a clear good or bad, but to recognize how problematic the overall underlying structures that these guys existed in and allow them to be who they were and operate in the way they operated. It was just, it was very interesting and fascinating to dig through all that. If you want to learn any more, I have audio files. Um, I've got more pictures. If you scan the QR code that's up on the wall, there's a lot more information on the website. I actually have um, my family members reading the letters that are the backgrounds for the portraits. Um, for instance, my twin brother is Samuel Lyman Hinckley. Um, so he read Samuel's letters. And my father is Henry Rose Hinckley III. So he read Henry's letters. So I have that connection going on, and they can listen to them read the letters of their ancestors. So that's there if anyone's interested in looking into it. So before I dig into the artistic process, because that was a lot of talk, <laughs> anyone, want, anyone have questions or comments or anything before I dig into the art side of things? So she never left the South. Her daughter oh. married. Yeah, I know it's super oh, okay. confusing. Sorry, um, <laughs> her daughter married Sam and moved up here. Um, and so that was in '38. So yeah, and she died within that year. She immediately got pregnant and she died ten days she after. Died in yeah, and she died in She died in childbirth. Yeah. So that connection. That's why I think Henry had never met his grandma. And I don't believe Sam ever saw Elizabeth again. Um, and I, I would be very interested to know how Sam and Henry ever met. Um, I have no idea. Um, my efforts to do research in the summer were, were very limited in the pandemic and travel. I would love to be able to fill in holes um, about the story um, of the same things. Um, so, and the Roses, because apparently Dan Roses is also a bit of a Need to be built. So yeah, she never left. And actually, she yeah, lived yeah, to the right old age of when it was, she lived until 1880. She was born in 1795. She lived a long life. Um, she had two husbands and multiple children. So, yeah. She's a great little southern day. Okay. So, was, was um, he was before the day of Emerson for anyone? Oh, yeah. So, um, there are continued evidence in her letters of continued financial support to the South, particularly after the war. There's actually, I have an IOU um, to a, a single-day cousin from Henry for $300. Um, so yeah, the, the financial connection to the South, particularly I think in the post-war years, continue. Yeah. And Samuel's letters, his shift in his thinking about slavery and how he's such an opposition to it, did it seem to be more of a cultural shift for him or economic? It's it's hard because it certainly it couldn't have been economic because this was killing him financially. Like he was not making, he actually won, he's about like quite a bit, but he's not making money. He, he did recognize that he's not losing money. And so he was kind of like thankful that he wasn't losing money, but he wasn't making money. Um, so I can't imagine it was economic. I think it was, he couldn't stomach this idea that like the South would be so ungrateful and so vicious and to, you know, so I think it was more of a, you know, being a northerner, and so I think it was more cultural. Um, 
but it's hard to, you know, it's hard to know this. It can move with what I have and what I have. Um, yeah, I'm just curious how you ended up with that particular slice of your family. Is it because it was so well documented in those letters? And you can tell me the okay. yeah. Part of it is the incredible amount of documentation, but also part of it is the time here. Because if you're going to talk about race relations, um, you can't pick a period of time more like clearly defined. You know, it, it's a way to start talking because like people write from slavery back, right? Um, so it's an easy way to enter that conversation. Um, it's or easier. It's not a comfortable conversation, um, but it's a place to start. Um, and then obviously the idea is it continues beyond that. You know, like this. It's not yeah. like this was isolated and it stopped in the 1860s by any means. Totally. So, I mean, I just yeah. I've done stretching my family. You know, gets to like the genocide of indigenous people. Which part. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, unfortunately, I feel like there's a lot of that with this family that I haven't even touched on yet. Yeah. The president said she had Yeah. So, go here. Did you look into the Malayan family? A little bit. Um, so, I've dug into the Malayan family here and there. Um, I, enough to know, like, I mean, Richard was the common ancestor. And I can't, like, at one point, I did know when the split happened and, like, because the Lyman family in Connecticut has actually a well-documented history of like abolition. And there was like a document they wrote that was against the um, the Runaway Slave Act. There was they were part of the Underground Railroad. But the Northern Lymans were not that. They were very much on the anti-abolitionist kind of not in any way interested in ending. There were actually um, a lot of relatives of uh, Anne Jane Warren and, <coughs> and her husband, Judge, Judge Joseph, who lived in Northampton. And for example, her son, who was Joseph IV, was quite an abolitionist. He um, <coughs> was a friend of Theodore Parker's. And um, yeah, I mean, there's no question about it. And also they had a daughter who was uh, Susan Warner Wesley. And uh, she too and her husband too were abolitionists. And there's a wonderful book by um, Sidney Nathan's okay. book The Three Family. And Anne Jean, who um, had dementia in the whole her old age, um, was here for my age. Black women who had escaped from the South, and the whole objective of Susan and Peter Wesley was to find the, the children. And the book is called To Free a Family. Okay. Gosh, look into that. Yeah. So that's that. There's a ton of lot of documentation I did not get to. Like, I think UMass has a lot yes. of their, and I, I just didn't have time to dig into it. So I know there's a, a, there's a whole part of that. Like, it's a huge family, it's ginormous. And so I haven't gotten into, I, yeah, I'm sure there's a ton that I'm missing. Thank you for letting me know. Was there anything else? Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, the art process. Oh, that was, I forgot what that said. <clears throat> so there's my wall with the, the portraits. Um, so you've got Elizabeth as the largest portrait there. Now, Elizabeth is a little bit different than the other ones. Um, if you've seen the website, you've seen the, the images that this came from. Um, I did not have any images of Elizabeth. Um, I have a hard, I find it hard to believe that there aren't. I'm sure there are. It seems to me that a woman of her standing, um, who lived that long, especially in the 1880s, that there would be a painting or a photograph somewhere of her. Um, I, can, I was able to find one. Um, so what I ended up doing was I took a painting um, that was done around 1827 of a woman in Charleston um, who was a contemporary of Elizabeth's um, and photoshopped myself into it <laughs> and then used that as a reference. <laughs> so she looks vaguely like me because it is vaguely like me. Um, I don't think Elizabeth probably looked that much like me. Um, but there was sort of not just the, the kind of convenience of needing a reference, and my face is the easiest one to come by. Um, but also the idea of seeing myself 
in my family history. So it worked conceptually too. So it was one of those like, okay, that will work. Um, so she's a little different. Now the other portraits um, are done from actual references. Um, Henrietta's was done from a painting because I remember she died in '38. So photographs, while they exist, are by no means a norm. Um, it's going to be wild before even the upper classes use them with regularity. So hers is done from a painting. The other three portraits um, are done from portrait, are done from photographs, and I'll show you this in a minute. Um, when I was getting started, I wanted to, I was doing research, and I went up to Maine, because um, a lot of my family ended up in Maine. Um, and I was visiting my great aunt and uncle's house and looking for um, photographs and letters and things like that. And I was looking at these walls, and I was very interested in that idea of like, the picture wall. Um, and so I had these two pictures, and just kind of looking at that, and I really like that aesthetic. And so I started to think about having kind of like a Victorian picture wall, um, was what I was thinking about. And so that kind of stuck in my head. And so I started to, to think about doing the portraits. But I knew going into this that I didn't want it to be just portraits, because that would kind of defeat the purpose of what this art is. So these are the reference images I pulled from these portraits. We've got Sam um, there, and then Henry in his um, uniform, and then Mary. Um, and so what do you notice the black and white? <laughs> so I ended up doing um, color studies just to kind of consider the palette going into it. Um, and then I began to actually work on the portrait itself. So I don't know if you realize, these portraits are felted. And so this is bringing me into the project. So everything else is done. I'm sorry, that was what I said about my family. Um, this is kind of my contribution to this, is I, what I do as an artist is do felt images. They're mostly figurative, they look very painterly, it's 100% of them. There is no paint involved in any of them. Um, and so I use two different processes. So we're going to take a quick look at how this works and how I create this portrait. So it starts with a pre-sketch. Um, sometimes um, I will sketch it out with chalk, which like I'm doing here. Sometimes I will do an image transfer. These were all done um, by creating an image using just a chalk pencil um, to create that outline so I have a place to start building the image. Then I get to the actual felting. So I'm using merino wool um, for my portraits. I love merino, it's super soft, it's really fine, it blends beautifully. And so this first um, video here is of me blending the fibers. And um, it, this is the one that tends to fascinate people the most because I'm not physically changing the colors of the fibers. The fibers remain the same color but what it's happening there is optical mixing. And so you're basically shuffling the deck, so to speak. And so all those colors lie next to each other um, until you get what looks like a different color. So what I'm blending right here with all these pinks and purples and tan is kind of a shadow color for the face. Um, then I'm going to use that wool and I'm going to start to needle felt the image. So needle felting uses barbed needles. Um, and so as you poke the wool, it tangles the fibers. And the more you poke, the more it tangles, the more it tangles, the more it fits. Um, needle felting came around, um, it was an it, it a, a industry that, um, the industry needed a way to felt synthetics. And so you had to have a way to do it because synthetics will felt the way traditional felting works. Um, and so that's where the needle felting came from. And in the 90s it became a craft, and so now it's my medium. So, I knew that I wanted to incorporate silk because of the family's connection to the silk mills. So my idea was to mount these silk and portraits on silk, so that meant I had to cut it out. So these portraits were then trimmed out, and so that, that way I'd be able to continue the healthy process um, and then attach it to the silk background. Um, so this is me uh, trimming out the Elizabeth portrait um, from the background. This tends to make people gasp. <laughs> she was fine. <laughs> so this is all though before I do the wet felting. Now wet felting is the more traditional felting process. And it is not necessary. I could have left it at needle felting and there are many people who do. I choose to wet felt because I like the integrity of um, the surface or the surface quality of a wet felted piece. Um, it's more solid to it, it has a different sheen to it, and it's, um, it becomes kind of pastel -y, um, and I really like the quality of that. So, I end up wet felting. And so wet felting has been around for as long as human beings have been interacting with wool. Um, it's one of our first textiles. It's 
And so it basically involves hot water agitation, essentially. We've added soap um, as well. Um, and so it's soap, hot water, and agitation, and that causes the fibers to swell. Um, and then you use the agitation to get them to stick together, and they become permanent and connected. Um, and so what you're seeing me do is do the, the massaging, and then there's a whole other one. Um, it's funny, I do, this is actually footage from a live, um, I'm on social media a lot, and I will do live streams of my process. And anyone who hangs out for any amount of time on any of my lives, when I'm doing my public events, there's hundreds and hundreds of rolling. Um, and so people always have fun helping me keep count. Um, and then it gets rinsed out and try. So now the next part was working these backgrounds. And I decided that I wanted to bring their voices into the background. So I decided to use, I have all this text. I used their letters. The only person I did not have a letter for was Henrietta. And I ended up, ended up using her father's will for that because she's mentioned in her father's will as he's, she's just born. He's dying. He knows he's dying. He wants to account for her education and her well being. So she's in it as well. Um, so this right here is Sam's letter. He is by far has the worst penmanship in the game. So she's over here. Um, actually, his son and his wife complain hardly about his poor penmanship and um, how it, it, it kind of goes down as he gets older. Um, so this is his letter where he was talking about his viewpoints. Um, on, and this is early on. This is January 2nd, 1861, when he was talking about how he would allow slavery in the territories. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do solo printing. And so I created a negative, a large negative of the letter. Um, and then I use this uh, photosensitive dye. This is a solar fast dye. Um, and I completely saturate the silk and then put it out in the sun um, with a negative over top. And it creates a positive of that image. Um, and so then you just rinse out the ink and now you have a dye. So it, it, that, what's lovely about that is it, it maintains its translucency. So it's not ink sitting on top that becomes opaque, it's translucent because it's the actual fibers are dying, which works for my purposes because I wanted that see through quality. So after I um, printed the backgrounds, I then need to attach the portraits, and I'm using needle helping for this, um, so that way it's kind of blending right into the portrait. Um, so just those needles that go right through the silk, um, the wool catches from behind the silk and it tangles it, and it essentially attaches it very solidly to the back of that silk. So all the portraits are attached in that manner. Then I wanted to have layers, because as I said, this wasn't just about having portraits, it was the idea that it was to think about the stories behind the people, and that there's more than, than just that sort of slayer. Um, so each portrait has a hidden layer, um, and that has to do with the privilege um, of that person, or the, kind of their roles in systems of oppression. And so there is a piece of glass with a printed image attached to that glass, and then my husband, who is a um, cabinet maker, was able to help me make these light boxes. Here I thought I was helping out by buying all these antique frames. We wouldn't have built the frames. <laughs> um, I was like, no, we're going to attach the light boxes to antique frames that are really impossible to fall apart when you touch them. Um, <laughs> so we attached these boxes to the back with the, um, the lighting. So right here you see me attaching LED lighting to the inside of this light box that was constructed um, so that you can light from to see that hidden layer. Um, so there's the circular ones and then there's also the square ones and they get that, the inside of the box is white so it diffuses or rather bounces the light back and you get the look from behind. So, now, remember back when I said I wanted the picture wall thing? <laughs> so part of that was to thinking about Victorian wallpaper, right? When you're in these like Victorian houses and they have these amazing wallpaper. I don't know if anyone's ever been these all they just court. I've always been fascinated and just obsessed with really beautiful wallpaper. So I decided I was going to make my own wallpaper um, for this exhibit, but I wanted it to have meaning, just like everything else. So I created my own design. So what you see on the left there is a design I created. I don't know if you can tell what that is, but on the left, it is a mulberry leaf yeah. with the silk cocoon and the silk. And then on the right, you have the cotton. Wow. So it's the, and then the thread in the middle. Um, that cordicel is in. So the idea is that this is that combination of my family having ties to both the North and the South and having kind of, you know, that balance in there and kind of both sides of the story. Um, and then also the creating of this huge chart. So the, the idea was I had to get the fabric printed because it had to be fabric to go with the little hair rather than the paper. Um, and then I had to sew that together. So I had this huge, you know, three panels wide. Um, and I had to somehow get the family chart attached onto that. So 
this became, so this is sort of about the journey of getting um, the wall created here. So the fabric. So my husband, once again, to the rescue, comes up with a tool to help me create concentric circles that are perfectly lined up in tape so I can paint on this and create um, the chart. Um, so this took, the, the background, the painting of the background took two and a half days of pretty much non-stop work. Um, and that's not including all the printing that my mother did on her cricket machine. Um, so we had everybody involved. Um, I had my kids helping me get this put together. Um, and so I was, you know, getting a little chart on there and then ironing on all the things that were printed out to create the lettering and all the names on the chart um, to get that all organized. It was quite a production. <laughs> Sometimes it's my daughter starting out names um, to be ironed onto that chart, making sure everything was where it was meant to be, and then trying to iron it up and keep it from getting wrinkled um, in the process. So, um, kind of in the end of this is it's sort of like as I was finishing this up, two years of kind of research and art making and trying to figure out how this is useful and not just kind of a reflective act. I, I was trying to work my way through like, how is this helpful? Um, and my hope is that those interacting with the art, particularly those like me who have these Northern families or these long, well-documented histories, um, take a moment and kind of perhaps investigate um, a little further into all the dynamics of your ancestors and the roles they have played in our country, um, and not just kind of like the banner, like things that we learned, you know, not just the banner marks, um, but also kind of all the nitty gritty of it, um, and reflect on that and think about how that informs who we are. And I guess my, my thought is that it's not just about, because we, we can kind of put in a larger context of like the history of our country and what we're founded on, but if we can personalize that and think about how our own history and our own stories form like that, and these systems um, that didn't just exist in slavery, but were very much fundamental to who we are as a country that are built on oppression and privilege. Um, and so kind of reflecting on that, and my hope is to not, I feel like we get stuck in the kind of the, the shame of it, or maybe, you know, that, that I, which is not helpful because we get defensive and, but they did this. I, mean, I don't want to get people to get stuck in that, but to see how um, we can still work toward making things better without getting stuck in that. You know, we can't change history. We can't change what our ancestors did. But we can recognize who they were um, and how that informs where we are. Um, and so, and the end result is to maybe, in some way, find ways to act um, to like change those systems and where we are in things. Um, you know, for me, that was making this art, but it goes beyond that too. You know, I'm a teacher, and so how I build my classroom and try and make it a functional space for all of my students um, and letting them bring in their own history and their own stories and their own interests that is not based on. Um, so things like that, um, small things, not necessarily big, earth-shaking, huge things, but small things, just thinking about how we interact and how we think about things, um, and trying to not, trying to hear and not get into a defensive posture when we think about this stuff, because it's not really comfortable, it's, I mean, this is, this was exhausting, it's not particularly, you know, it's not particularly fun in day. Um, it's interesting, um, and it's worth thinking about. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my hope, is that people can be reflective after interacting with this. So, thank you.
you are who you are. You are, you are built by your experiences, your lens. You can't step away from that, so you're right. There's a certain amount that you will never be able to objectively see, because you just can't. You are who you are. But I would like to think that we can try to be more objective about it and, and be a little more aware and conscious of it. I just like to give you a compliment. So, as I sit and listen to you, I think among other things about how history was taught in your school. And generally, how black and white it was. You know, these two parties went to war and decided one because they were right. And then the victors get right to the victory. And then the other thing, the way history was taught then was it wasn't personal. You know, people were trying to be objective. And you're doing the opposite. Having a personal as a way in to make it as complicated as it was. Mm -hmm. I just wouldn't salute you for that. Thank you. Well. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you all for coming out tonight. I very much appreciate you being here. Mm -hmm. And share. <laughs> Thank you.